This week on Vaticano, we take a deep dive into the passion of Jesus Christ with the help of a medical doctor and medieval stories about the true cross of Jesus. Is there a future for Christians in the Holy Land? Learn about the Vatican's efforts to help them stay. But first, let's celebrate the 95th birthday of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI and travel with Pope Francis to Malta. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Pope Francis revealed his health problems during the return flight after a two-day trip to Malta. The Holy Father shared that his health is a bit fickle and he has problems with walking and that at his age, you don't know how the match will end. Let's hope it goes well. In Malta, extra measures were taken to ensure that the Pope would not have to take stairs. A special lift was installed at the Basilica of St. Paul in Rabat to enable Pope Francis to visit and pray in the grotto, where according to tradition, St. Paul lived for three months during his stay on Malta after a shipwreck. Despite his health problems, the Pope's appeals were widely heard during his two-day stay in Malta. Welcomed by thousands of Catholics, the Pope again made a comprehensive plea for the protection of life. Papa Francesco. Papa Francesco. Papa Francesco. Papa Francesco. Francis urged the Maltese to defend life from its beginning to its natural end. The Holy Father also appealed to people in Europe to make room for people who cross the Mediterranean as generously as they are currently making room for European war refugees from Ukraine. Speaking in front of a crowd of thousands of people at an outdoor mass in the capital of Valletta, Pope Francis urged Maltese Catholics to be tireless witnesses to God's mercy. Before his departure back to Rome, the Holy Father met with migrants and refugees at the Halfar Reception Center. On the return flight, the Holy Father spoke not only about the state of his health, but also about his impressions. He said, I was happy with the visit. I saw the realities of Malta, the great enthusiasm of the people, both in Gozo and Malta, great enthusiasm in the streets. I was amazed. This year, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI turns 95 years old. He's the longest lived person to have ever held the office of the Roman Pontiff. Let's remember his upbringing. Joseph Aloysius Ratzinger was born on April the 16th, 1927 in Marktalamin, a small German town belonging to the district of Altote in Upper Bavaria. It was Holy Saturday and his parents decided to baptize him the very next day. Easter Sunday. Little Joseph was the third child of Joseph Ratzinger, a police officer, and Maria Rieger, a housewife. His older siblings, Maria and Georg, would be ever present during the different stages of the life of their younger brother. In 1937, when Joseph was 10, his father retired and the family moved to the town of Hufschlag in Traunstein, close to the Austrian border, almost 20 miles from Salzburg. Ratzinger would remember this little city as his true home. In 1939, at 12 years of age, Joseph entered minor seminary in Traunstein, where he would stay until 1942, the year in which the Nazi regime closed the seminary and destined it for military use. But the period of his youth was not easy. The Nazi regime cultivated a climate of strong hostility toward the Catholic Church. Only his faith and education from his family would help him to confront the difficult experience of those times. From March of 1939 until 1945, the law on the Hitler Youth forced all young people between 14 and 18 years of age to sign up for its ranks. Young Ratzinger didn't escape this fate. In 1941, upon reaching 14 years of age, Joseph entered the Nazi youth movement against his will. 
and continued his mandatory attendance despite the closing of the seminary in 1942. It was precisely in this scenario where the young Ratzinger would discover the beauty and truth of the faith in Christ. In his memoirs, then Cardinal Ratzinger would underscore the fundamental role of his family, which was ever a clear witness to kindness and hope. Hello, and welcome to this week's Vaticano Updates, the most important news from the Holy Father and the Vatican. During a meeting with a delegation of Canadian Indigenous people, accompanied by the Catholic bishops, Pope Francis said that he feels shame and sorrow for the abuse, the discrimination, and the lack of respect towards Indigenous identity in Canada. His remarks came after the reports of unmarked grave sites at formerly church-run schools. You can watch the whole encounter between the Pope and the Canadian delegation on the EWTN Vatican YouTube channel. This is the ambulance Pope Francis sent to the children injured in the ongoing war in Ukraine. Papal Almoner Cardinal Conrad Kravetsky personally traveled to Lviv on April 29th and delivered the ambulance that was blessed by the Holy Father. Pope Francis met with Polish President Andrzej Duda and thanked him for welcoming the Ukrainian refugees. It is estimated that the country received 2.3 million people over a course of one month. After a meeting with the Holy Father, President Duda laid a wreath of flowers at the tomb of St. John Paul II and told journalists that he personally invited Pope Francis to visit Poland. The Vatican exhorted to put Catholic identity back into Catholic school settings. The Vatican's Congregation for Catholic Education published a 20-page instruction affirming the importance of evangelical goals and explained the role that teachers and administrators play in its achievement. The document says that everyone has the obligation to recognize, respect, and bear witness to the Catholic identity of the school. Father Thomas Powers, a priest from Connecticut, has been appointed as the new rector of the Pontifical North American College in Rome. He will succeed current rector Father Peter Harmon on July 1st. Father Powers is an alumnus of the Pontifical North American College and has been living there for almost 10 years while serving as the Vatican's congregation for bishops from 2005 to 2015. Thank you for watching us for this week's Vaticano Updates. Enjoy the rest of the program. Easter is near, Holy Week, inseparably connected to the Holy Land, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, the Holy Sepulchre. This is where Jesus lived, proclaimed the gospel, and died. This is the place to which millions of faithful have come to see with their own eyes, where Jesus prayed, walked, and suffered. Popes Paul VI and Benedict XVI referred to this land as the fifth gospel, as did Pope Francis at the beginning of this year. But the situation in the Holy Land is problematic, not only in Israel. The term Holy Land or Terra Sancta usually also refers to Palestine, Western Jordan, Southern Lebanon, and Southwestern Syria. The Congregation for the Oriental Churches, under the leadership of Prefect Cardinal Leonardo Sandri, has authority over the Holy Land, but also oversees the activities of the Church in many more Middle Eastern countries, including Iran, Iraq, Egypt, and Turkey. Now, what is the situation of the Christians in Bethlehem and Jerusalem? La situazione è... The situation is calm, although there are difficulties especially for the Palestinian Christians. For them, it is very challenging not being able to pass freely between Israel and Palestine. Of course, we try to draw attention to this. Why are you doing this? 
and why do you not let them pass? The pandemic has worsened the situation of Christians in Israel and Palestine. Tourists have stayed away. For many, this is the only source of income. Jobs are hard to find. Even more precarious is the situation for Christians in Syria. Recently, Cardinal Sandri traveled there to meet with the Catholic bishops. Despite the end of the civil war, many people still want to leave. What can we do? What can our audience do to support Christians in Syria? Apparently, la situation is tranquilla. The situation has calmed down. I have been there in October and recently for several days. It is possible to travel. One can safely drive and walk the streets of Damascus, as well as Homs or Aleppo. But the situation is very critical if we look at the levels of poverty. There is no electricity. There is no gas. The whole country lives in fear of an uncertain future, and there is no hope. And of course, there is the flight of the Christians. The Holy Land wouldn't be the fifth gospel if it didn't ultimately point us to hope. It is indeed a providential occasion for the whole church to profit from this collection. Through it, we can live the Good Friday, the Passion and the death of our Lord in union with the holy places that Jesus dwelled in. Cardinal Sandri is referring to the global Good Friday collection, Pro Terra Sancta, for the Holy Land. Collected in every parish around the world on Good Friday, it's the main source of material support for Christian life in the region. Last year, six million U.S. dollars were given. Two-thirds go to the custody of the Holy Land in Jerusalem, and one-third is administered by the Congregation for the Oriental Churches for the benefit of several countries, including Syria and Iraq. The money is used to maintain the sacred places. Equally important are the costs of formation of candidates for the priesthood, support for clergy, and educational activities. What exactly are you supporting with this collection on Holy Friday? There are all these institutions, dioceses, and parishes that have their projects. And one very important aspect of our help for the Holy Land are the schools there. The Catholic schools do not enjoy a lot of state support, but are essential in maintaining and forming the children and youths in our faith and in the Christian life. The Christian community in the Holy Land doesn't have a lot of means of its own. It depends on the generous help coming from foreign countries, primarily coordinated by the church in collaboration with many Christian aid agencies. The Good Friday collection is essential, but there is more that can still be done, especially in countries like Syria. We also need to do an assessment. Why is there no respect? Why is there no religious liberty? Why is there no respect for human rights? Why is there the threat of terrorism? Do the sanctions really help? Cardinal Sandri is calling for an end to the sanctions against Syria. While they might have had the intention of ensuring human rights and freedom, sanctions specifically harm the Christian minority in the country, the prefect warns. Many are fleeing. The Pro Terra Sancta collection helps sustain the church in the Holy Land. On Good Friday, we're called to remember the suffering of Jesus and contribute to the end of the suffering of his followers today. Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Still not my will, but yours be done. He was in such agony and he prayed so fervently that his sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. With these words, Luke the Evangelist describes the approaching death of Jesus. Luke, who was also a doctor, includes in the episode of the Garden of Gethsemane a detail that other Gospels don't describe. Jesus, in a profound state of anguish, sadness, and fear, begins to sweat blood. 
Ora, questo è un fenomeno che non è sconosciuto. This isn't an unknown phenomenon to medical science, in the sense that it can be observed in people who experience strong, very violent emotions. It isn't, for example, an exceptional event with those condemned to death. It is certainly due to tachycardia, when the heart beats with an elevated frequency. There's high pressure, and then a dilation of the capillaries. Now, in normal people, the dilated capillaries become red. They begin to sweat. But when all of this is very violent, then these capillaries can rupture. And therefore, little, little drops of blood exit, which gives probable reason to what happened to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Once captured, Jesus is condemned before the Jewish authorities. In the Sanhedrin, Jesus is accused of blasphemy for being declared the Son of God. The prescribed punishment is the death penalty, but as the capital punishment had to be decreed by the Roman authorities. Jesus is sent to Pilate to be judged. Pilate condemns him for the crime of treason, for having proclaimed himself King of the Jews. After the public trial, Jesus is stripped down and scourged. It's not a scourging with a rope or a belt, but truly with weights that when they struck the flesh, they wounded it, provoked a bruise, provoked hemorrhaging. But in the fury of the blows, you reach the point of ripping out flesh, lacerating the skin, tearing into muscles. The man of the shroud truly represents what scourging was and that it regarded the entire Catania surface of he who was scourged. From the shroud, we also obtain the certainty that the crown of thorns was, in reality, a helmet, a well and true helmet that Roman soldiers placed on Jesus' head to deride him and scoff at him. Jesus, at this point exhausted, is led to Golgotha, carrying upon himself for nearly 600 meters a weight of approximately 90 pounds, the patibulum of the cross, that is, the horizontal axis upon which his hands were subsequently nailed. They proceeded to hammer down the nails at the level of the wrists. There's an exact point where the nail goes through. So the image of the nail that passes through the palm of the hand isn't. Those images are already true because, anatomically, it isn't possible. The condemned person then would have been placed in a vertical position, and then all of the weight of the body would have ended up on that nail. If he were nailed at this level, after a short time, the nail would have split the flesh of the hand, coming out in the space between the fingers. With his hands and feet nailed to the cross, Jesus is placed in the vertical position. Starting from that moment, the crucified person begins to suffer between asphyxiation and pain because the arms splayed out on the cross hyperextended the condemned person's thorax, as if he was in a state of deep inspiration, but he's unable to expire, to expel air. So it's not an asphyxiation because he's unable to take in air, but because he's unable to expel it. Losing blood, already exhausted, the moment arrives in which the condemned person no longer has strength. At that point, he dies of asphyxiation. Regarding the death of Jesus, Jesus probably didn't die of asphyxiation. He didn't die as any other person condemned to crucifixion would die. And how the two thieves died. The Gospel of Luke says that Jesus cried in a great voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. This great cry of Jesus leads one to hypothesize that Jesus died of a heart attack because Jesus has lost an enormous quantity of blood. If there is no blood, there's no hemoglobin. If there's no oxygen, the heart suffers a heart attack and the heart no longer works. Paraphrasing the words of Pope Francis, the physical passion of Jesus can be a source of hope and courage, teaching us that each of us is personally loved up until the end.
Throughout the history of man, legends about the true cross of Christ have inspired artists and writers from the entire world. One of these works is found in the Italian city of Arezzo, concretely in the main chapel, the Cappella Maggiore of the Basilica of St. Francis. It's a cycle of frescoes known as the Stories of the True Cross by Piero della Francesca, one of the most important pictorial works of the Renaissance. Everything began in 1417 when Baccio di Mazzo Bacci, a wealthy businessman from the Tuscan city, died, leaving part of his fortune to the Franciscan Basilica for the decoration of the chapel of the choir, known today as the Bacci Chapel, in honor of this family from Arezzo. But the work began much later, in 1452, and it took 14 years. In 1466, the Bacci Chapel was presented to the world as a unique space. Across the lateral walls and in the lower section, Piero della Francesca lays out the frescoes on three levels, without making use of any architectonic framework. During the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, the most popular sources of the stories of the True Cross were the Bible and the book, Golden Legend, by the Dominican Santiago de la Voragine. But Piero revolutionized the narration of this iconographic series, following personal criteria from both the thematic and plastic points of view. To better understand this series, also known as the Legend of the True Cross, we'll analyze the most important scenes divided into three thematic groups, beginning with the fresco located in the high part of the right wall. First stage. The first scene narrates the death of Adam. The artist presents us with a dying Adam. His third child, Seth, encounters St. Michael the Archangel at the doors of heaven, and he gives him a branch from the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Seth plants it in the mouth of the already dead Adam, in this way redeeming original sin. Just below, the painter narrates the Queen of Sheba in adoration of the wood and the meeting of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. The Queen of Sheba kneels before a bridge over the Silo River upon recognizing the wood of the tree of the cross and refuses to proceed. At the left, one sees the adoration of the bridge by the Queen of Sheba, and on the right, how the Queen is received in Solomon's palace, and he extends her his hand. This fresco can be seen as a desire for the union between the Orthodox and Western churches in the 15th century. Finally, at the left, we find the eradication and burial of the sacred tree, the final scene of this first stage. Second stage. The second thematic block begins with the scene located in the lower right part of the chapel. The Annunciation. The death of Christ is announced in the cross shape of the tablet. Following to the left, we find Constantine's dream, in this scene, he sees the cross and a voice says to him, under this sign, you will be victorious, inciting him to rout paganism in this way. And finally, again at the left, Piero della Francesca narrates Constantine's victory over Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge. With the cross on a shield, he defeats the enemy and later converts to Christianity. Third stage. We arrive now to the third and final stage of our walk through the work of Piero. Just above Constantine's victory, we see the torture of the Jew. Queen St. Helen, Constantine's mother, tortures a Jew to obtain information about the place where our Lord Jesus Christ had been crucified. Just to the left, we find the discovery and proof of the true cross. Helen finds the cross in Jerusalem. Three crosses are dug up and they test which is the true cross, resurrecting the dead with it. Just below, Piero depicts the battle between the Byzantine Emperor Heracles and Khosrau II, and the defeat and beheading of Khosrau, who had stolen the cross. 
The final scene of our trip is located at the upper section of the left wall, the exaltation or restitution of the cross, the return of the cross to Jerusalem. As one can observe in the stories of the true cross, Piero della Francesca doesn't present the scenes chronologically, but he follows purely formal aesthetic criteria, creating symmetrical effects between the different frescoes, without renouncing a theological and philosophical dialogue between the counterposed scenes.